Uh, I'm Elizabeth Gondonell, licensed marriage family therapist from the East Bay Center for Anxiety. And I have my colleague here, Deb Palmer, who is in Missouri. And Deb, you want to tell us a little bit what you do and your license and so forth? I am a licensed clinical social worker, but I have spent the last 25 years being a medical social worker in a hospital setting and outpatient clinics primarily working with folks um, with a cancer diagnosis or some kind of chronic illness. Yeah, 25 years working with that. Wow, you've got a knowledge base to work from, definitely. And that's one reason why, you know, you and I were talking last week, and I, I uh, so appreciate your time. And one reason I wanted to talk to you today is because, um, you know, with the pandemic going on, uh, one of the things that I'm really seeing both personally, professionally, as a result of this uh, really traumatic event, I mean, it, and it's hit everybody on some level, whether you're, you know, a doctor or work in a restaurant or a parent or a teen or a child, it's just across the board globally. Um, is one thing that we're starting to see now is noting um, what do we do with our elders, uh, either when they have the coronavirus and they're passing away or. Uh, when they have a terminal illness such as cancer, and now we can no longer connect with them like we used to. And so I found the conversation that you and I had last week when I was asking you some questions about my own situation very inspiring, and that's what motivated me to bring you here today and ask you a couple of questions to kind of share with the people out there who are grappling with this issue of either a family member or loved one that's terminally ill or uh, a parent who is you know, 65 or older or so, and is either passing away from corona or some other uh, situation where they are dying and we can't do the rituals that we normally do. And, and how do we do this? It's, you know, it's, I think there's many layers to it and it's really starting to come up. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that at all. Does it seem like it's arising more? Um, it, it, it is, I think. In Missouri, we're not at the same peak that you are in California. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, they're predicting in the next couple of weeks our, we will have more of a surge of cases. But yes, we've already um, yeah. experienced, because we've taken those precautions, of limiting visitors, um, which I think has been the hardest thing for folks to grapple with, is that they cannot be as involved as they'd like in their loved one's care. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more to that? That's, that's one of the questions I, I was hoping to ask you and get some responses about is, I know I'm going through it with my own mother who is in a nursing care facility in Illinois, and um, she's now in quarantine. And they, you know, the first week there was one uh, corona, and now there's 10 in the last week. Oh, and, wow. you know, those thoughts crossed my mind. Uh, it, and then I got the call from the nurse last week that said, you know, we're doing everything we can, but if your mom gets it, she's very frail and she's not going to make it. It will, she will die from it. And those are, you know, really, that's very daunting words. Um, and even more so I, I was wondering, you know, for example, in my situation, I have everything laid out. My mother, know, I know exactly what's going to happen when she passes. Papers are signed. We've had the hard discussions. But it really got me to thinking about what if you haven't had those hard discussions? Or what if, like you said, there's still decisions to be made, mm -hmm. right? Can, can you speak to a little bit about that of um, the, you know, apart, as far as rituals, what do we do now? How do we grieve? Okay, well, let's see where I wanna start with that question. I know, um, it was a little mixed up, wasn't it? <laughs> um, no, no, there's just a lot there. There is. So from the, I kind of wanted to start from the beginning with, um, you're right. Most people do not think about any of these things that you and I have talked about until something happens, like they get a cancer diagnosis or they're in an accident or something like that. With the pandemic, it's made it really more in the forefront of people's minds because it's it's in, it's in the news every day and um, there's so much more conversation about it. So for folks that um, have a loved one in a hospital or a care facility and they can't be there, um, what I would recommend is you find some contact person. 
So if it's the nurse, if it's the social worker, if it's the, in our hospital, it's called the patient experience office, someone that you can contact and get their phone number and be able to call them and get updates or call the nursing station and ask for the physician to call back and just know that they are busy, you know, but they most likely will call you back. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sometimes it's hard for them to know who they need to speak with. Um, and particularly now, um, we are asking that you designate one family member mm -hmm. because they can't call all five kids. Right. And that is the kind of the spokesman that they're gonna um, speak with and get their questions answered. So that's kind of where I start with folks. Um, Absolutely. If I can interrupt you, because sure. you brought, you highlighted four steps, I think that are really uh, valuable that I just want to summarize yeah, for sure. people who are watching or listening, which is in these situations with the pandemic, or if you're dealing with a, an elderly parent in a facility uh, or hospital, mm -hmm. uh, really good idea to uh, establish yourself with a contact person. Right. Like for example, I know my mom's on the second floor. I always call the second floor nursing station. Mm -hmm. And I ask, I have a couple of nurses names who I know their shifts and I talk to them. So right. that's what you're talking about, right? Is to, right. yeah, to have your contact people and, and to make sure you have the numbers so you can get updates and that what I heard here is sometimes it requires a little patience to know that the doctor or nurse or your contact person will get back to you. Right. But right now they're dealing with so much um, I know even the facility that my mom's at, they've sent out emails saying, you know, please be patient. We're doing the best we can. Uh, the staff is overworked, essentially. They will get back to you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that communication, it, it's good to understand that they will get back and there's just so much mm -hmm. going on. And so then the other one, which I really liked what you said, when there's a multitude of family members, it's good to designate one family member right now, not have everybody calling uh, repeatedly or everyone talking to, you know, five siblings talking to the same nurse, um, right. that it's good to have one family member designated at this point in time. And, and honestly, that's good for any situation, but particularly now um, that it, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, 